Um, Let me uh, just read through it quick and then we'll pray and then we'll study. I will give thanks to the Lord with my whole heart. I will recount of all your wondrous deeds. I will be glad and exult in you. I will sing praise to your name, O Most High. When my enemies turn back, they stumble and perish before your presence, for you have maintained my just cause. You have sat on the throne giving righteous judgment. You have rebuked the nations. You have made the wicked perish. You have blotted out their name forever and ever. Their enemy came to an end in everlasting ruins. Their cities you rooted out. The very memory of them has perished. But the Lord sits enthroned forever. He has established his throne for justice. And he judges the world with righteousness. He judges the people with uprightness. The Lord is a stronghold for the oppressed. A stronghold in times of trouble. And those who know your name put their trust in you. For you, O Lord, have not forsaken those who seek you. Sing praises to the Lord who sits enthroned in Zion. Tell among the peoples his deeds. For he who avenges blood is mindful of them. He does not forget the cry of the afflicted. Be gracious to me, O Lord. See my affliction from those who hate me. O you who lift me up from the gates of death, that I may recount all your praises, that in the gates of the daughter of Zion I may rejoice in your salvation. The nations have sunk in the pit that they made, in the net that they hid, in their own foot has been caught. The Lord has made himself known, he has executed judgment. The wicked are snared in the work of their own hands. The wicked shall return to Sheol, and all the nations that forget God. For the needy shall not always be forgotten, and the hope of the poor shall not perish forever. Arise, O Lord, let not man prevail. Let the nations be judged before you. Put them in fear, O Lord. Let the nations know that they are but men. Let's pray. Father, I pray that as we study this psalm tonight, you would uh, direct my words Speak to our hearts by your Holy Spirit, and you will glorify yourself in your words tonight, we pray. Amen. Okay, so the psalm tonight, it kicks off with uh, the giving of thanks to God. I will give thanks to the Lord, to Yahweh. Uh, Remember the capital L, capital O, capital R, capital D. That Lord is referring to the name of God. I will give thanks to Yahweh with my whole heart. I will recount all of your wonderful deeds. I will be glad and exult in you. I will sing praise to your name, O Most High. So initially, as we kick off, this is a psalm of praise. We've had all sorts of different psalms we've seen in recent months. We've seen psalms of woe, psalms of of struggle. And there's, there's oppression and struggle in this psalm too. But predominantly, above all else, this is a psalm of praise. And he's, gonna, he's uh, giving thanks to God with his whole heart. And he is recounting all of the wonderful things that God has done. So two things in that. Firstly, to to give thanks with a whole heart is not just a, a poetic expression. There's something significant to that. When we thank God... It is very easy, and we're going to see in a moment that this is a person who uh, is, you know, obviously David, but he is a person uh, who is oppressed. He is a person who is is struggling. Um, At the very, very beginning, in fact, before even before the first verse, um, and and these notes, by the way, that are put in, they are actually part of the original text, and they are inspired as well. It says, "To the choir master, according to Muthalaban." And that sounds like a funny name to us, and it literally means the death of a son. Which obviously, for New Testament believers, might have implications and ramifications, but it's a bit speculative. But um, it could well refer to uh, the death of the child um, that the prophet Nathan spoke to David about following his his adultery with Bathsheba. It could refer to Absalom at a later time. Um, it, it could, you know, either way, there could be, not definitely, it may be a person, but, you know, it could be linked to that particular woe. Or maybe if it was Absalom looking back at the times when his own son tried to kill him. But this is a, this is a psalm written from a heart of oppression. And yet, when he praises God, he does so with his whole heart. Now, I fully understand the, the combination 
of joy and lament. This is something that is a very biblical concept. It's something that we ignore, I think, in day-to-day life. But whenever we go to a funeral of a Christian brother or sister, then we understand it. There is someone who has died and we sob and we grieve and we mourn because they're gone. But yet we don't mourn like the world mourns because we rejoice that they are now in a better place. Literally, they are, they are with the Lord. We envy their position and yet we mourn for them. That's not contradictory. That's, that's just the outworking of those two sides of things. In, in a similar way, we can be oppressed and therefore we can, on the one hand, be crying out to God and saying, where are you, God, in the midst of my trials? And yet at the same time, we can be thankful for what God has done in the past. And that thankfulness is not a half-hearted thankfulness, because we're half thankful and we're half crying out. The two don't, just like Jesus being fully God and fully man, we can be fully joyful at a funeral that the person's with the Lord and fully grieving. It's not a contradiction. It's not a 50-50. It's not a sharing. And I think in the same way, there's a place that we can get to. It's a place we've got to, we've got to pursue where we can be crying out to God in the midst of oppression, in the midst of affliction, and at the very same time, give thanks to Him wholeheartedly. I am so thankful for you, God. And secondly, I'm thankful because I recount all your wonderful deeds. Again and again and again in the Psalms. The Psalms recount the things that God had done for Israel and Israel's past. Now, if that was true for them, and there were great things that he did for them. I mean, you know, the Exodus is one of the key things they keep coming back to. And uh, God taking them through the wilderness. But we who live on this side of the cross, we have so much more that we can look back and recount God's deeds. You've got to remember, for these guys, the Exodus was hundreds of years previously. It was generations and generations before. And for them, it wasn't something they had any memory or recollection of. It was a historical event. But on the basis of historical events, they said, we know we can trust you, God. There are times when I have been so afflicted, I haven't known what to do or where to turn. And the one thing I could turn to and trust in when it seemed like God wasn't there, when it seemed like God didn't care, the one place that was always available was the cross. I don't get this, God. I don't understand why you would do that. But I see the cross and I know you can be trusted. And that's got to be, for us, the basis of our thankfulness. That God is the God who who sent his son to die in our place for our sins. And while our circumstances may just scream at us, there is no God. While our circumstances may scream at us, he doesn't care. The cross says the exact opposite. And it cries louder. And so, it is good that we would recount his wonderful deeds. And notice, recount all of his wonderful deeds. You know, the Exodus is as much a miracle for us as it was for the Jews. In fact, the Exodus has greater significance to us because we understand the point of Passover in a way that they never did, for example. And so we can look back at those deeds. And I think sometimes it's hard for us to to remember that Yahweh, Yahweh the God who did miracles through Elijah and Elisha, Yahweh the God who did all those miracles in the wilderness through Moses. That that same God is our God whom we serve. He's no less powerful. He's no more removed. In fact, he's far less removed. For the Jews in the wilderness, God was with them. And the story of the Exodus is the story about God who would turn up here and God who would turn up there. Who was given a permanent dwelling place in their midst. But he dwells in our hearts. That's a lot closer. And so we have, um, we have a, a God that we must turn to, remembering his power, remembering his strength. And we'll talk more of that in a minute and recount his wonderful deeds. And as we redo that, we, can, we will be glad and exult in you and sing praise to your name, O Most High. 
And again, I want us to fully get the context. The context of this praise. It's a, the context is one of affliction. And he was able to, to, uh, to be glad. He was able to exult. He was able to sing praise. Why? Because he recounted the deeds. I know how hard it is in the midst of affliction to see anything other than your affliction. To think of anything other than your affliction. To pray about anything other than your affliction. It's a great challenge. But one of the solutions has to be this recounting of the deeds of God. That's our survival mechanism. Now, verse 3, after that two verse, kind of uh, spend some time on that. It's the, it's the key prologue, foundation of the psalm. And now as he kicks into the, to the rest of it, he says, My enemies, they turn back, they stumble and perish before your presence. For you have maintained my just cause. You have sat on the throne giving righteous judgment. Now, as we come into the psalm here now, <laughs> this is a reminder of the, the, the difficulty of interpreting and applying psalms for today. I posted a uh, humorous meme last week on Facebook. Uh, some of you might be familiar with the uh, famous Carly Simon song, You're So Vain, I Bet You Think This Song Is About You. And it was a picture of someone with their Bible and it said, You're So Vain, I Bet You Think This Psalm Is About You. And... Uh, you know, there is a tendency for us, because it's scripture, right? So it's, 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 it's got to be a good thing to praise and to sing. And on that basis, Keith Green famously wrote the song that said, Take not your Holy Spirit from me, which we should never sing, because he, he can't and he won't, because he's promised he won't do that. But for David, it was a very real threat. That's the old covenant, new covenant difference. And so as we dig into this psalm, there's quite a lot of that. And we've got to think, and I, and I have to say, there, is no, there are so many areas where Christians struggle with this old New Covenant distinction. But there is no area where it is more greatly overlooked, more greatly abused, more, more greatly forgotten about than when it comes to worship. You know, we come into your presence, O Lord, today. To, no, we don't. We were in his presence when we woke up this morning. We're in his presence when we leave. Because his presence dwells within us. We're no more in God's presence now than we will be when we're sleeping tonight. That's it. That's, that's the new covenant. In the old covenant, oh, uh, better is one day in your courts than thousands elsewhere. Well, that was wonderful because they could spend thousands of days elsewhere, you know, living in a different region, then come to Jerusalem and go and be in his courts. And what a day that was. But even then, they're in the courts around the presence of God. We now have the presence of God in us. The presence of God is in us when we sleep, when we go to the restroom. We can't say better is one day in your courts unless we understand from that psalm that every moment of every day we are better than in his courts. We are in the holy place. That's the contrast that we've got to remember. So with that in mind, notice here he says, my enemies turn back, they stumble and perish before your presence. Now, in Exodus, the presence of God would come. There was, you know, the, the Egyptian armies pursuing the, uh, the Jews who have fled. And they come to the Red Sea and they're stuck there and they can't cross the Red Sea right now. And the Egyptian armies come after them. And the presence of God came between the Egyptians and the Jews to protect them. And it was only after the Red Sea parted that the presence of God left. So the Egyptians could follow and pursue the Jews and then be drowned in the Red Sea. It was the presence of God that did that. Now to get our heads around this, okay? That very same presence of God is the indwelling Holy Spirit. The glory of God. That Shekinah glory the Jews spoke of. That shining brightness, that dark cloud. Ominous for the enemies of God glorious to the people of God and yet still ominous as well you cannot see my face or you'll surely die Exodus 33, 34 and that presence, that power now indwells us so when he says 
where my enemies turn back, they stumble and perish before your presence. We have to remember the presence of God to overcome the enemies of God is within us. That doesn't give us necessarily the power to use it at will. God will do his purposes in his ways. But it's intriguing in all sorts of ways. It means that the enemy of God can be working against my life. And some person struggling with their sin maybe, being a Christian for a week maybe, can walk into church and speak to me or lay their hands and pray for me and the enemy's work can be thwarted. Like that. Why? Because that person has the presence of God which stumbles the enemy of God. Isn't that just a powerful thing? That's just, that's just it's one of these things we've seen in our Ephesians series. Just that central theme throughout Ephesians of the indwelling ministry of the Holy Spirit. The indwelling power of God within us and the difference that that makes. So I think that when we see this psalm, we've got to see it in that context. And, and of course the other thing in the, in the new, under New Covenant, well... The other thing to some degree is that, of course, our, we do not now, in our, as enemies, we'll see this when we hit chapter 6, but our enemies are not human flesh. We don't wage against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers. Our, our war is a spiritual war. And yet at the same time, that spiritual war and the harm the enemy does is often done through human hands. And, you know, in the same... The way at that time, there were enemies of God, the different nations who were against the enemies of God, but they were all empowered to do so by demonic entities. You know, there were the demonic beings. You know, Daniel briefly saw that glimpse of the prince of Persia, who or whatever that was, but clearly there was some demonic power that had some sort of power or authority over a whole geographical realm. Persia being modern day Iran. He may still be kicking around for all we know. Now, I think that we just need to, I say that so we can understand, on the one hand, our enemies are not flesh and blood, but on the other hand, some of this could be relevant more physically because the enemy does use people to afflict and to persecute God's people. So with all that in mind, he hit verse 4, for you've maintained my just cause, you sat on the throne giving righteous judgment. And so the presence of God is there maintaining the just cause, sitting on the throne, giving righteous judgment. Now this is important. When the enemy attacks us, when we're afflicted, when we're persecuted, when we're oppressed, God's presence is within us, God is just, and God will make righteous judgment. There are things that oppress me that I want resolved yesterday. Last week, last month. But while they remain unresolved, and while I, while I remain afflicted, God is just, he makes righteous judgment, and his presence is within me. We've got to take comfort in that. We have to take comfort in the fact that God doesn't cease to be powerful, he doesn't cease to be just, and he doesn't cease to be the one who will execute his judgment and do his will regardless of our circumstances. And this is the danger, you know, I see all the time these days on social media, people saying, you know, so-and-so's had this problem resolved, and this has now happened, and this blessing has happened to us, and this miracle's happened, and oh, God is good. Well, yes, he is good. But the time to remember that is not when something good happens. I mean, it's an appropriate response, of course, to praise God when good things happen. We give thanks to the one who gives all good things. Of course we do. But at the same time, the time we really need to remember how good God is, is in a time of affliction. That's when we need to remember how good God is. Because it's not as obvious to us. We don't see it so readily. And that's what the psalmist is doing. That's what David's doing. He's in a time of affliction, reminding himself of the goodness and the justness and the righteous judgment of God so that he can see in his circumstance, he he can see his circumstances through biblical eyes. He can look at what he's going through and not just say, well, I don't understand why God's not here. This should be resolved and it's not resolved. These, These enemies should be thwarted. They're not thwarted. But God is just. God is good. God will do what is right. And so he reminds himself in verse 5, you've rebuked the nations, you've made the wicked perish, you've blotted out their name forever and ever. 
The enemy came to an end in everlasting ruins. Their cities you rooted out. The very memory of them has perished. Well, nations rise and fall. I, I know that, you know, I come from, obviously from Britain, which has uh, had an empire many years before this nation in its current state even existed. And here, I think the mentality, we have that mentality in Britain, but the mentality here, I think, is even greater, which is that we think we're great nations and we're just going to be here forever. Well, don't you think the Romans felt that way? Or the Babylonians? You know? Where, where are the Babylonians now? I mean, you know, I know Saddam Hussein tried to kind of resurrect Babylon from the dead, but the great Babylon of the past, gone, done, dusted, finished. And there were nations that rose and there were nations that fell. And for God, who sees time, up, down, up, down. But when you're there in the midst of it, when you're there in the midst of it, it seems like it will last forever. America is a baby in diapers. It's barely existed. There were nations greater than America with a bigger influence in America that lasted longer than America has that you've never even heard of. Their names are forgotten. At least in, apart from a few PhDs who study those kind of things. I mean, guys, we've got to remember how up and down these things can be. Look at Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, this great king. Everyone feared him, everyone revered him. You know, and he was arrogant and puffed up. And God said, okay. Madness. And he ends up eating grass like a cow. That couldn't be much fun. Unless God also miraculously gave him three stomachs to digest that cellulose. He was, that would have been unpleasant for all sorts of reasons, let's just say. But he was down there chewing the cud. And God humbles the proud. And these nations, they... Um, these nations they persecuted Israel and God has punished them and that's not simply uh, a random thing Genesis chapter 12 when God makes his covenant with Abraham he says I will bless those who bless you and I will curse those who curse you and at that point although the you in the covenant thus far had been singular at that point having promised that he would be a seed of this great nation the you becomes plural. I will bless those who bless you and curse those who curse you, plural. And I do believe, and I'm happy to say this publicly, and it's not a, not a political thing at all, but I do think that part of the reason for America's success and prosperity in general terms has been, not simply a, a Christian heritage, I think even more than that, has been the, the, the way it's treated Jews. And I don't simply mean supporting Israel. Israel and Jews are not the same thing, although there are, there are links, um, just to clarify that. But, you know, there has always been a welcome home. There were more, there were, until the establishment of, um, of Israel, there were, in fact, even beyond it for quite a long while, there were more Jews living in New York City than there were in Israel. And America has always been a home for Jewish people. And that's because in other places they were kicked out, they were persecuted, they were, they were um, thrown out. And uh, you don't see those nations that kick them out doing quite so well. Let's just say that. So I think that's worth remembering that these nations have been judged and what have you. And this, the, the, the goyim, the nations, the, in contrast to Israel, they're the ones who've been rebuked and they're the ones who have perished. And they've had their names blotted out. This time, it, it just looks like things will go on forever. We, this nation could be gone in a generation. It's perfectly possible. Keep your eyes on God who rises, who raises up nations and who puts aside nations. Don't, keep your, don't have your faith in the nation. Don't have your faith in a president. Don't have your faith in government. Have your faith in God. He can bring them up and he can crush them down and he can and we, we think oh that's it it's, it's all done now there's no turning around and then God changes things back for the better again he's sovereign he does as he wills but the enemy comes to an end the cities are rooted out now one thing before I move on from this section um, he is praising the God who's made the wicked perish 
We struggle this day in this era where we're ever more pressured by the world to redefine love the way the world defines love. We're ever pressured to, for love and acceptance to be the same thing. It gets harder and harder for us, I think, in this day and age to understand that the wrath of God is a holy and righteous thing. It's, it's sometimes easier to talk with friends who aren't saved about the grace of God. The forgiveness of God. The goodness of God. But that can only be seen in the light of the wrath of God. And God's wrath, God's judgment is holy and it's righteous. When we get to heaven, when we see him face to face, we will not turn to him and say, God, you are so awesome. But that that killing of all those people, I didn't really approve of that. We will see him, we will bow before him, and we will acknowledge him to be awesome and righteous in all his ways. It's a difficult doctrine for us to understand. Yes, I understand New Covenant. We're talking about the enemy being spiritual, not physical. But this is a God whose wrath is poured out on physical people. But we see the nature of God in the fact that he gave his son to take that wrath so that we need not receive his wrath. But the wrath of God is still righteous and just. And their name is blotted out forever. That, I believe, is talking about their names not just being forgotten in a sense of the nation being forgotten in the end of verse 6. I think... Verse 6 talks about the memory of them being passed away, but the blotting out, which of course is a parallel in verses 5 and 6, the blotting out is the removal of their name from the book of life. Remember in the Bible there's two books of life. There's the book of life and there's the Lamb's book of life. And sometimes people get confused because names being blotted out of the book of life is, is talking about people losing their salvation. It's not that at all. I don't believe people can lose their salvation. Your name is written in the Lamb's book of life when you receive eternal life. But the book of life, your name is written in when you receive physical life. When you receive eternal life and your name is in the Lamb's book of life as well, then your name will never be blotted out from either book. But if you die and lose your physical life without being in the Lamb's book of life, then your name is blotted out from the book of life. That's the blotting out that I believe is being referred to here. There will be people who there will be people who we now in this world love dearly, who will be punished for eternity, and we will get on our knees before God and say, Your righteous judgments are holy and good and loving and kind and right. I don't fully understand that. I get it intellectually, but I struggle with it. Struggle with it greatly. But I understand that my struggle is because I am not viewing sin as seriously as I should. And I don't see the awesomeness of God as seriously as I should. I don't view his righteousness as seriously as I should. And like Isaiah, when I see him and I come before him and I bow down, it will all make sense in a heartbeat. Verse 7. But the Lord sits enthroned forever. He has established his throne for justice. He judges the world with righteousness. And he judges the peoples with uprightness. So in contrast to these nations that rise and fall and people who come and go, people who are forgotten about, people who are judged, God is there. He has always been there. He will always be there. And we are blessed that the one who is, who is always there is one who judge, judges rightly. And his judgments are right. We've covered most of those themes and I want to keep moving on. But his throne, he's established his throne for justice. So his rule is a just rule and it will be there for the purpose of bringing about justice. We'll come back to this theme in a moment. 
Now verse 9, the law is a stronghold for the oppressed, a stronghold in times of trouble. And in those and those who know your name put their trust in you. For you, O Lord, have not forsaken those who seek you. Okay. Being oppressed does not give you the favor of God. There is two things here that need to be combined. There is the one who is oppressed and in times of trouble, but they are clearly, in context of verse 10, those who name the name of God and put their trust in Him. So let's put these things together. Knowing the name of God is knowing the character of God. One of the things that comes up again and again and again in the Psalms is the reliance of the Psalms on Exodus 34. Specifically Exodus 34, I think verse 6. You know, when, when God passes by Moses and says who he is, Yahweh, Yahweh, you know, and he describes himself as merciful and gracious and long-suffering, and he makes this description of himself. And uh, one, uh, one scholar, a uh, local one actually, William Varner, talks about how, um, how the Psalms in many respects and in many places are an exe- exegesis. It's, a dis- it's an expounding of Exodus 34. It's Exodus 34, God reveals his character to Moses and the Psalms expound on that. And there's certainly, there's certainly links here to that. Because when God reveals his self, in it, you know what, I'm, I'm not going to keep referring to it. Let, let me just read it. You, you keep keeping the Psalm. Let me just read it. Um, Exodus, I'm reading from Exodus 34. Um, when the Lord passed by him and proclaimed, verse 6, The Lord, the Lord, so Yahweh, Yahweh, he says his name twice, Yahweh, Yahweh, a God merciful and gracious, slow to anger, abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness, keeping steadfast love for thousands, forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin, but who will by no means clear the guilty, visiting the iniquity of the fathers on the children of the children's children to the third and fourth generation. And as I said many times before, that passing on of the effects of sin was there under Mosaic covenant if anyone teaches you any stuff about generational sins today it's again it's that confusion between old and new covenant it's all gone in Christ all gone but it's showing that the nature of God is to have mercy but when mercy is not received there will be that righteous judgment now that's God his in in verse 6 through 7 that's God's determination of his character but look how he does it he says Yahweh Yahweh the very this is not just meaning God it doesn't just mean Lord it is the personal name of God and the idea of name is that name is connected to character you will know my name doesn't mean you'll know I'm called Yahweh as opposed to being called Bob or you know or or Dick or Harry or whatever else you know knowing his name means knowing about his abounding love. It means knowing about his long suffering. It means knowing that his nature is to have mercy. It's knowing the character of God. Now, those who know your name, verse 10, those who understand Exodus 34, verses 6 and 7, put their trust in you. We don't need to sell God to the world. We need to present God to the world. You understand the difference? We haven't got to wrap God up in some sort of, you know, make him more acceptable. There are entire churches and groups of churches and affiliations that are dedicated to wrapping God up in the nicest bundle possible so that a world that hates him will somehow love him. You know what? Forget all of that. Exodus 34, 6 and 7. That's God. Take him or leave him. But those who know his name, those who know his character, will put their trust in him. Those who see that he is righteous. Those who see his righteous wrath against sin. Those who see his tendency, his nature to be merciful, to have covenant-keeping love, where he's faithful. Why is it that the Jews here are being protected against their enemies, the other nations? Because God made a covenant with them and he is faithful to his word and he's faithful to his covenant. And when you are afflicted, there is nobody better to turn to. 
And so it is those who know the character of God. They put their trust in because you haven't forsaken those who seek you. And that's back to Joel 2 last week. Those who call upon the name of Yahweh. They are the ones who will be saved. Always, throughout time, throughout history, the ones who call on God to save them are saved. And he, he rejoices and he delights in saving people who cry out to him. And so it's those who know his name who put their trust in him. They're the ones who know that he doesn't forsake them because they know his character. They know he doesn't forsake his own. And so they reach out to him. And that is why, verse 9, he is a stronghold for the oppressed. That's why he's a stronghold in times of trouble. Now, when you are in a stronghold in a time of trouble, you might have all the hordes and enemies surrounding you, bombarding you and sieging you. But while that stronghold stands, you remain. God's promise is not to take us out of trials. It's to be our stronghold in times of trials. And that's a huge difference right there. So verse 11, sing praises to the Lord who sits enthroned in Zion. Tell among the peoples his deeds. For he who avenges blood is mindful of them. He does not forget the cry of the afflicted. And so... We sing praise to God. God is exalted and gosh, if he's exalted there, how much more so now having died and risen from the dead and now been exalted and sitting at the right hand of the Father, Christ himself, God incarnate, then that is an exalted place and so we sing praises to him. And do we, we talked about this last time with Joel 2 for those who are here. But again, the name Yahweh is a name that was translated in the uh, Greek of the Old Testament as kurios, the word for Lord. And whenever Jesus is referred to as Lord, confess, uh, uh, confess with your lips that Jesus is Lord, Lord, Jesus is Lord, Jesus is Lord, just constantly. That is basically saying Jesus is Yahweh. This Jesus is associated with the name of God in the Old Testament. And so... We sing praises to him. He's been exalted. And we tell among the people his deeds. Now, who are the people that we tell about him to? Well, obviously, we tell him to everybody. But in this context, have a look. Verse 11. For he who avenges blood is mindful of them. Okay? So the peoples are the them. Right? The peoples and then them. He does not forget the cry of the afflicted. So the afflicted are the them and the them are the peoples. So he's saying, you know, we sing praises to God. Now, I've said this many times before. I do think one of the most neglected things in the church today is the psalm of lament. And there needs to be a place within the church for corporate lament so that we mourn with those who mourn and weep with those who weep. But at the same time, there must be rejoicing by the afflicted alongside those who aren't afflicted. Those who are doing well can tell the deeds of God to those who are afflicted. That's a ministry of encouragement. That we, we say, those of us who have been through affliction, people who've been through affliction, have seen the faithfulness of God, can come alongside those who are in affliction and say, look at what God has done for you. Look at what he's done on the cross. Let me share with you how he's walked me through affliction. And let us rejoice God together because he's worthy of praise. I will sing a song of lament and I will mourn with you. But you must sing a song of praise and rejoice with me. That's how church operates and functions. And that's really, and again don't bother turning there, I shall, shall do it for you. But uh, that's what Paul speaks of in the most personal of all of his letters. And when he says in 2 Corinthians chapter 1, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies and God of all comfort, who comforts us in all our affliction, so that we may be able to comfort those who are in affliction with the comfort with which we ourselves are comforted by God. In other words, when we go through affliction, it enables us to be in a position to comfort others as they go through affliction. There is purpose to our suffering, if nothing else, 
so that we can minister to those who suffer. So we're going to tell the people of the community, we're going to tell the church about the deeds of God so that we can rejoice together and put our trust in him and be reminded that he doesn't forget the cry of the afflicted. You know, when you're afflicted and you cry out to God, boy, can those cries just seem to be unheard, you know? You cry out to him again and again and again and again. We just keep crying out to God. And there just seems no response sometimes. But God hears every cry. And he does not forget the cries of the afflicted. I'm reminded again in Exodus of how the Jews would cry out. And it says that the Jews cried out and God heard their cries. And he remembered his covenant with Abraham, Isaac and Jacob. Now... That is it, as much as when it talks about the outstretched arm of God, where of course God the Father had no physical arm, it's talking in, in anthropomorphisms. He's talking in human terms so we can understand it. In the same way, uh, when, when we talk about, uh, um, about God forgetting and remembering, we don't mean that he's actually literally forgotten and he just so happens to remember, you know. What we're talking about is we're talking about God communicating in human terms. That once again he turns himself. He hears the cries, he hears the cries, and it's as if he's forgotten about them. And then he remembers his covenant. He remembers his promises. He never forgot his promises. He never forgot the covenant. But this using human terminology to communicate to us that there comes that point when the cries of God's people are brought back into focus. And that is well worth us remembering. Verse 13. On the basis of everything that's come before, we can say, Be gracious to me, O Lord, O Yahweh. And notice, by the way, in verse 11, sing praises to the Lord, to Yahweh. Be gracious to me, O Lord. Because now we've mentioned that they know his name, there is this constant reference to the name of God and the character of God is linked to that. And so that's who we cry out to. Be gracious to me, O Lord. See my affliction from those who hate me. O you who lift me up from the gates of death, that I may recount all your praises, that in the gates of the daughter of Zion I may rejoice in your salvation. Now, in this context, the salvation is not spiritual salvation. We always see the word salvation and we just presume it means being saved from our sin. But in this context it's not. Salvation is used in the Bible routinely just to mean physical salvation. And contextually that's clearly what's going on here. He's saying, be gracious to me. Look at my affliction. Those who hate me, they're obviously persecuting us. See my affliction. O you who lift me up from the gates of death. So, in other words, God is the one he turns to because God can lift him up from the, from the very gates of death. Here he is, and he is so, he is so wearisome, oppressed. I don't even know what, but he's in such a condition, either physically, emotionally, or spiritually, all three, that death is, like, is right before him. The gates to enter into death are right there. He's not looking at death in the distance. He's standing before the very gates of death. Man, I'm going to have to turn back to 2 Corinthians again. Give me one sec. Because there's a similar thing said there. He said, just going on from that section I read previously, we don't want you to be ignorant, brothers, of the affliction. Same concept here, affliction, that we accounted in Asia. For we were so utterly burdened beyond our strength that we despaired of life itself man I want to teach 2 Corinthians just so I can spend a few weeks digging into that phrase and try and work out what on earth he meant that's something that's just really impacted me recently the last few days a friend kind of was discussing it on Facebook and just kind of made reference to it and what on earth happened they despaired of life itself and that's similar, that reminds me of what we have here in Psalm 9, right at the gates of death. And so he cries out to God who would lift him up from that place so that, there's a purpose to it, so that I may recount all your praises that in the gates of the daughter of Zion I may rejoice in your salvation. I may rejoice in the salvation that you did in taking me away from the point of death in my affliction. Now, 
Why darkness? Why in this life so much darkness? There aren't easy answers to questions like that. But one of the best I've heard is this. That the greater the darkness, the brighter the light shines. When you've been before the gates of death and God lifts you up, then that salvation is great indeed. And there is much rejoicing to be done. And there is a promise, there is an implied promise, almost a bribe though not quite. God, if you save me from this, then this is going to be a good move for you. <laughs> it's a good deal for you, God. You just think of all the praises I can give you when you rescue me from my oppressors. You think how good you're going to look in rescuing me from this situation. <coughs> and that's the implication here. So don't mishear me earlier on when I say, you know, this is a wonderful thing, God is good. And I say, we must say God is good in the bad times. I mean that as well. Because when he shows his goodness to us in rescuing us from our trials, it is of course a time of great rejoicing, the greatest rejoicing. But having said that the context, and accurately and rightly said that the context, this is physical salvation, we can't help but notice the analogy that there we are before the gates of hell, the very gates of hell, and we cry out to God and he saves us. He saves us from eternal death and eternal damnation. And so there is, of course, here a picture of salvation in a far greater sense as well. Now the nations have sunk in the pit, verse 15, that they made. In the net that they hid, their own foot has been caught. I love that phrase. I think that's great. Do you know what that happens again and again and again? The, the very things that people do to harm us will end up hurting themselves. Sometimes it's dramatic and poetic. And there's no greater example of that anywhere in the Bible than uh, in the book of Esther, where those gallows are made and the maker of the gallows is hung in the ones that he made. That's just powerful. It's a very powerful picture. But you know, beyond that, you know, it goes so far beyond that. The sins that people do against us, God will judge them for. Those deeds won't go unpunished. Those sins against us won't be overlooked. No sin gets overlooked. Or maybe they're Christians, in which case their sins will be forgiven. But they haven't been overlooked. They've been paid for by the blood of Christ. But these people who do things to harm, these unbelieving nations who did hurt Israel, those very things they did have become their undoing. Now, sometimes that's specific, like I say, the pride of, of um, uh, Nebuchadnezzar, so mine went blank from it, the pride of Nebuchadnezzar was his own very, very own downfall. We have the Mordecai and Haman story I already referred to. And, uh, but sometimes it's, it's just looser than that. It's just people hurting God's people and ending up getting destroyed for it. Uh, the Lord has made himself known. He's executed judgment. The wicked are snared in the work of their own hands. And that's what I was saying. This, it's just the very things that they do are the things that will bring about the executing judgment of God and that they will be judged for. Now, we're used to our sailors in Psalms. I'm not sure what Higaion is. I saw a humorous article this week talking about, oh, very tongue-in-cheek, how these kind of terms may have meant guitar solo. They're musical terms. I mean, they mean something musical. But I think for us, from an exegetical point of view, it simply means that there is a natural break between this section and the one to follow. So I think that as we come now to verse 17, we have this break, and we have perhaps a refrain. We have perhaps a, a chorus to be repeated or something like that. But in, a, in, a, in an understanding sense, it's perhaps something that's a summing up of what's come. So verse 17, the wicked shall return to Sheol, all the nations to forget God. Sheol is what we translate as hell typically. Some versions may say hell. I think that's unhelpful because we see hell as being a place of damnation and judgment. 
And hell is a place of damnation and judgment, right? But it is now. It is now. And it didn't used to be. Now, if you're confused by that, let me explain very briefly. There is a parable in Luke's Gospel where there is the, uh, the rich man, and the King James calls him Dives, and there's a poor man named Lazarus, not to be confused with the, the Lazarus of, uh, of John's Gospel and uh, the, the resurrected one, the guy who had two funerals. And uh, Lazarus was a poor man, and he, he was afflicted, he was persecuted, and he just he had sores and just lived homeless and begged and just had, there was nothing good much in his life at all. What purpose was there for him? And yet, somehow he had faith in God. And when he dies, we're told he goes to Abram's bosom. A place of comfort where the patriarchs went before him. And right next to him in the place of death, but separated by a great chasm, is the rich man when he dies. And this man who had all this luxury in life and all this goodness, he is now suffering torment. And that chasm couldn't be crossed. Now, that was the place of the dead. There was a good part, Abram's bosom, if you like, and there was a bad part. Sheol just was the place of the dead. It was neither good nor bad. But what happened in history was the cross of Jesus Christ. And when Jesus died and was resurrected, that blood that he shed was sufficient not merely to cover sins like the animal blood did but to totally forgive sin and those people who were in the place of the dead in Abram's bosom in a holding zone if you like weren't in heaven in the presence of God because their sin kept them from the presence of God but now the blood of Christ is applied to them and they're able to go to be in heaven with God so now Sheol hell is simply a place for those who are under judgment so, quick history of hell there for you. But here in this context, and again, it's the context of the psalm is always tricky, but the wicked shall return to Sheol. The idea is that their names at once upon a time weren't in the book of life. They'll die, their names are blotted out, and they go to death. All the nations that forget God. But for the needy shall not always be forgotten. And the hope of the poor shall not perish forever. And it's interesting that I use that analogy of, or that example rather, of Dives and Lazarus, the rich man and Lazarus, because that, that was a man who was needy, that was a man who was poor. But notice this, I, 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 er, I erroneously said but there, but it's for. The wicked shall return to Sheol of the nations that forget God, for the needy shall not be forgotten. There's a link between the two. In other words, those who oppress the needy, those who oppress the poor, they're going to receive their judgment for it. Christians today are more bothered about, you know, what clothes you wear, what Bible version you use, you know, whether you speak Christianese fluently. And you know, God, like he was in the Old Testament, is concerned still now far, far more not by our great offerings and sacrifices, how much money we put in the offering. He is bothered by how we treat the oppressed and the needy. That, that is a picture of your heart before God, the greater than almost anything else. If you give your money away, if you dress up smart and if you look the part and you speak your Christianese and you just look like the most godly person, but you oppress the needy and you break the broken and you hurt the poor, then you just, you don't know God at all. He doesn't want the sacrifices. The sacrifice he wants is the heart for those. And he will bring justice to them. Verse 19. Arise, O Yahweh, let, man, let not man prevail, let the nations be judged before you. Put them in fear, O God, that the nations know they are but men. Listen, as we finish and wrap this up. Those who oppress us are, well, Ephesians reminds us we don't wage against flesh and blood, but the ones who aren't flesh and blood use flesh and blood to wage against us. And they're just men and women are just people and the ones who empower them are ones that will receive greater judgment than them but in my heart is the living God 
His spirit is a down payment, a seal, a guarantee that I belong to Christ. I am his and he is mine. And nothing will ever sever that tie. And they can oppress and they can afflict. And one day God will remind them that they are just men. But the one that I cry out to, his throne is established forever. And so my cries and your cries are never in vain. They're never wasted. They're never futile. Don't give up. Never give up crying out. Never stop rejoicing. God is God. And he is always good. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word. Thank you for your goodness towards us. Thank you for your love for us. Father, may we have hearts like yours. May we be imitators of you. And Lord, may we glorify you in how we treat others. And Lord, in our times of affliction, may we rejoice. May we come alongside those who are afflicted, bring comfort, share in lament and share in rejoicing that we might love one another as you have loved us. Amen.